everyone. I'm Catherine Wells. I'm the executive producer of podcasts at The Atlantic and uh, also the co-host of a podcast called Social Distance. And today we are doing a live taping of that podcast, and we hope you'll join it. Um, a little background on the podcast, if you uh, haven't heard of it. We basically started this podcast, I think it was March 13th. March 13th, I was kind of coming out of a big project and realized that this was going to be a huge, you know, coronavirus was going to be a huge, intense global issue. And I realized I didn't know enough. So I called Jim Hamblin. He's the, uh, he's a staff writer at the Atlantic. He's also a doctor and Luckily, he's my friend, so I so I just gave him a call. We recorded that call, and ever since, we've been talking on this podcast, uh, Social Distance. So today we're doing a live taping. Jim's here. Hey, Jim. Hi, everyone. And we're also joined by Alexis Madrigal, who's a frequent friend of the pod and uh, comes on and helps us talk about uh, all things testing. Alexis Madrigal is a staff writer and uh, also the co-founder of the COVID Tracking Project. Hello, guys. Hey. So, like I said, this is a live taping and we actually, our show is very informal and it's really just about answering basic questions that people have. And so we're hoping you'll join in. You're welcome to join in. We are, um, you can just enter questions in the chat function and we'll see if we can get to some of them. Um, again, uh, Jim is a doctor. Alexis knows everything about testing and tracking. So, uh, you know, feel free to direct your questions to them too. But I was gonna start off uh, with some of the questions that are on my mind uh, this week. I mean, we've reached a pretty grim milestone, 200,000 deaths, and we're heading into winter. And I've been worried about winter since the beginning. I, I just, for several months now, I've been thinking the winter is not gonna be good. We're so dependent on being outside right now. Um, and then, uh, a couple months ago, uh, the CDC director, Robert Redfield, said, here's a quote that I'm going to read you, Jim, and I, I want you to help me understand this. I've heard the quote, uh, The actually. winter, huh? <laughs> I've heard the quote, Sorry? you know. You've heard the quote. Well, I'm going to say it out loud. Um, okay. It says, the winter is going to be probably one of the most difficult times that we've experienced in American public health. Um, that's terrifying. Yeah. Can you explain? Well, you... It took a cross country trip and are in a warm place right now, right? Yes, I'm in California, so I so I've left New York, though I was there for for the spring. Yeah, well, so kind of, I I've, it seemed like the writing is on the walls as you go through New York and every like the solution to so much life has been just do it outside or just open windows, just push people into uh, empty uh, parking spaces that are makeshift restaurants. And uh, now just sort of fall is starting to be in the air. Restaurants are starting to allow for 25% capacity. Um, schools are reopening. P uh, kids, not all kids, but some kids are meeting in class. Um, so it's this sort of perfect storm that makes a lot of people worry about resurgence. It's happening right at a time when um, there's a lot of fatigue, too, about all the distancing and masking. and People are sort of uh, uh, not. Uh, I th I'm worried about how prepared we are for the winter. That's not reassuring, Jim. My job is not to, not to reassure. I hope everything's <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah. Obviously, but there is a sort of perfect storm here, and I'm not the only one. You know, Redfield. Um, and when I talked to Anthony Fauci, he said that you know we are, have as a nation about forty thousand new cases a day right now. And if we wanted to be in control of this, we would be down at 10,000. And t <laughs> no country has dropped from 40,000 to 10,000 without extreme measures. Like, um, you know, basically you'd have, to, you'd have to lock down in an intense way. We've never made that kind of drop, even it, when we were at our most shut down. Right. And now one of the things about this that is kind of confusing to talk about is that there's so much regional variation and there's so much uncertainty. And so Alexis, I'm curious, um, I'm wondering, you, you're, you've been following the numbers the whole time. What, what do you think the winter's gonna look like? Do you, have you gamed out different sort of possibilities? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the base case here, the sort of default scenario, is that things get a lot worse um, in the sense of more people infected, more people hospitalized, and, and more people eventually dying. There, there is an alternative scenario, though, and you know, I think if we really, if we look at what happened during, you know, the Sun Belt surge, um, we were actually better able to contain it than I thought, as we were going through it at the time, might happen. Um, a lot of overlapping sort of half steps, a lot of um, imperfect but um, but smart things to do uh, kind of came together to bring transmission rates down and eventually to sort of contain um, those outbreaks in Arizona and Texas and Florida without very you know extreme measures. We didn't get to suppression levels. We didn't actually get rid of the virus, but we stopped you know kind of runaway growth. And I think the big question for me this winter is whether that same thing um, will happen. Like we know cases are going to grow. It's just like if we're sitting on this plateau of 40,000 cases a day, you know, the virus is pretty much everywhere. If you read, like I was just earlier this morning, reading like uh, one of the coronavirus task uh, force reports for Oklahoma, you know, they've got transmission in basically every county <laughs> there. And they've got high levels of transmission in, um, in about a third of their counties. So, you know, if you just kind of look at the basics of what we've seen uh, with this virus, if you've got that much of it floating around, you've got community transmission kind of everywhere, you're going to see, and you would then increase the amount of mobility and interaction that people have, you know, you kind of increase the metabolism of a, of a city or a state or a region, um, you're going to see more cases. I mean, it's just happened time and time again. The, there is this like sort of this scenario in this pandemic, though, where masking um, helps not only with um, COVID, but also with the flu, um, where testing begins to catch more contagious people, where a uh, vaccine rolls out among crucial uh, populations for controlling the virus. And maybe you don't see um, you know, the, the darkest winter in public health. Um, I do think that when I really like look at the scenarios, you see this kind of tremendous divergence, um, you know, and, and I think it's by what I mean by that is, you know, maybe it's only 500 people dying a day at the end of December, or maybe it's 1500. That's a huge difference. Like particularly, um, you know, you're talking 80,000 people in the hospital at any given time versus, you know, 20,000 people in the hospital. I mean, these are hugely uh, different numbers and a hugely different sort of on the ground reality uh, for the United States. And it's very hard to know precisely how to weight them, though, like I said, I think the, the base case here is that things don't go well. Um, the base case is that things don't go well. I mean, is there... Really, so it means there's no there's no scenario where we get this under control soon. This is definitely with us through the winter in a devastating way. Is that is that your sense? That yeah. would be my sense. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If Alexis said anything other than that, I would jump in and correct him. I mean, I, yeah. I, we, <laughs> I think there's been, you know, the talk of a vaccine existing has been conflated with the idea of a vaccine being widely distributed. We need to plan for a winter where a vaccine is not part of our lives. And I, I mean, addressing all, you know, the three of us and everyone probably who's listening, unless there are sort of essential workers uh, among among the, the listeners, that's, a, and that even that is a long shot possibility that there will be something available for them. Um, there are talks, you know, Dr. Fauci said that he would be uh, happy if the vaccine were 50% effective. Uh, ideally, it'd be closer to 75%. Right now, you have a, a poll saying about 50% of Americans would try a vaccine if it were available now. So, vaccine's not going to get rid of this. You know, Lexus is following cool testing developments, which can help. And we're hoping November there are rollouts of rapid tests, but those are not going to be perfect. Um, they're not going to be instantly everywhere. And <laughs> the 
a confluence of weather and a lack of economic stimulus. Um, you know, I think people are reaching a breaking point where there is going to be there are going to be a lot of things coming together right at the same time, and especially if there's not a bailout package that comes uh, that comes soon, then people are going to be forced into behaviors that are dangerous that they might have been able to work around when they had paychecks coming in um or when they had mortgage uh, uh, when they had no fear of eviction um that if we don't extend these things on a semi-permanent basis or possibly even permanent basis um it, it's all going to come together at a bad time i hope i'm wrong but um yeah i, I, yeah, mean, no. I think it's easy to I, I do think it's actually easy to paint like a, a pretty grim picture uh, as well like i'm 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 providing you the sort of like range but i i don't think jim is wrong at all that like you know some of the key constraints on viral growth may go away we also you know we don't really know what seasonality looks like for um this virus and so it's kind of hard to know we you know there's some sort of known things we know where they're going to change um most of which are bad, like on the the bad side of the ledger here, um, and there's also some kind of un, unknown things um, uh, about in colder places. Will the patterns of transmission um, really look very very different? Um, and I, I, yeah, I'm on the same basic pathway <laughs> that I think Jim is. I just I feel like there have been enough like twists and turns with this virus and with this pandemic um, to sort of expand our fan of possibilities a tiny bit um, to include things for some reason going better than we expect or some, you know, confluence of half measures coming together to work better, or slightly better than expected. Um, right, right. Yeah, that's I mean, that's been a lot of the challenge for me during this time that you both have helped me with is trying to be very realistic. Um, but also not fatalistic. Um, so anyway, I appreciate that. Jim, can I ask you one quick follow-up? And then Alexis, I'd love to talk to you about testing. But um, on the vaccine, Jim, you mentioned that it may only be 50% or 70% effective. Can you explain what that means? Sure. Um, so no vaccine is perfect, just like no medicine is perfect, no test is perfect. Um, at best, a vaccine offers offers you a really good shot, a uh, really good likelihood that if someone coughs in your face while they're infectious, that you're going to be protected, you're going to have immunity. Um, but uh, our best vaccines are not 100%. There'll always be some people who don't mount an effective immune response or whose immune response fades. Um, so there's been discussion about what the effectiveness of this vaccine or these vaccines against this coronavirus will end up being and how effective would they need to be to even be worthwhile. And we don't know yet. We're waiting on these clinical trials. It's very possible, even likely, that that effectiveness will end up being between 50 and 75 percent, meaning that you're very likely to be protected if you have it. Um, but you would probably still want to avoid, you know, really high risk scenarios. Um, once you get a whole population that's vaccinated at that level, it's effectively gone. Um, but when you're just rolling it out to start with, uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you go back to doing things exactly like you used to do. Like the night you get vaccinated, you go out and do karaoke you know, with all your friends uh, or whatever people are, like, you know, really looking forward to. The point is that we could that would it would, it would be miraculous in terms of like number of cases dropping, number of fatalities dropping. But you but as long as there's still that possibility, it means life does not go back to, you know, just doesn't go back to totally to normal. Right. Right. OK, well, let's talk about testing because we're getting some questions about testing and, and I have these questions, too. Um, Here's a question from John. What uh, are the realistic prospects of mass availability of cheap, rapid, at-home antigen testing? Um, that's for you, Alexis, but first, can you explain what cheap, rapid, sure. at-home antigen testing is? Yeah. Um, so most testing that has occurred to this point uh, occurs in big labs, um, PCR tests. These are looking directly for the genetic material of the virus. 
um, and they're sort of processed in um, in batches. Uh, what that has generally meant um, is that it takes a while for your results to come back, you know, anywhere from some hours to, in most cases, actually some days. Um, and obviously, for a lot of the really hot times in in places where there's been a ton of transmission, there's these huge um, spikes in testing demand, overwhelms the testing system, and suddenly, you know, it's taking 10 days. You know, this happened over the summer. It happened um, in the spring, of course, where we had um, very limited testing. And um, and so there's been a thought, um, and it's also very expensive in the scheme of things. You know, we're talking you know 100 to 150 dollars uh, a test. So there's been some thought of okay, well, what do we actually want to do? We actually want to detect um, contagious people, and there is a possibility that detecting some proteins that the virus produces or you know, one or another uh, protein, um, which is called an antigen in this case, would allow you to do fast and, and rapid testing, more like a pregnancy test than um, you know, something that gets sent away to a lab. And there are going to be these kinds of tests. In fact, um, some of them already exist, uh, but they require sort of like a little machine that sits on your desk um, and you can do the test. It takes 15 minutes. You know, one of the problems with that kind of um, fast and rapid testing is that, you know, it's fast to do one test in 15 minutes, but what if you need to test 10 people and you need to use the machine, you know, kind of serially that means it's going to take you like quite a while. <laughs> it's going to take you, you know, 150 minutes to do to test just 10 people. So in some circumstances, like say a classroom, um, that isn't really going to work. So that type of desktop testing is good for some things. A lot of them have been sent to nursing homes and and other places like that. But you really kind of want like a paper strip. You want uh, something that is very simple. That is. Um, cheap to produce, you know, say five or ten dollars. Some of these tests have been announced. You know, Abbott made a big announcement during the Republican National Convention. Um, a lot of other energy and test manufacturers that I've spoken with have kind of cast doubt on the timing of that, as well as like when Abbott will actually be producing large numbers of these tests. There are other manufacturers who are working on similar things and we're expecting sort of over the next few weeks to see a, a flood of emergency use authorizations for um, antigen tests of different types, you know, say coming in between ten and twenty dollars a test. Um, you know, manufacturing of these things is not simple though, um, and the characteristics of the tests are really important. Um, you know, there's kind of two ways that people use to describe these um, the, the accuracy of these tests. One is sensitivity; it basically means like what's the chance um, that you don't miss uh, an infection. Um, and then there's specificity, which is sort of what's the chance that you're going to deliver a false positive. And there are ten of two different camps who think each of these numbers is sort of more important. Um, you know, a lot of people are worried about, okay, but wait, I'm going to take on sensitivity. Okay, I'm going to take one of these tests and I'm going to get a false negative and I'm going to go, you know, hug grandpa and um, and infect grandpa when I thought that in fact I had gotten a negative test. And then there's a lot of people who've been, you know, in support of rolling out these kinds of tests who are more worried about the specificity of the test. And the reason is basically this, like let's say you start rolling out a million of these tests a day, a huge number of them. You start generating a huge amount of false positives and unwinding that could be quite difficult, particularly if people start to believe, as may be the case, that like every other uh, positive that you get in one of these rapid tests is in fact a false positive. So there are ways to deal with that. You know, maybe you package multiple different antigen tests, like in an over-the-counter kind of product. Um, maybe you immediately package in, you know, um, a PCR follow-up for anybody who is, you know tests positive. There might be ways of dealing with it on sort of like a product or like kind of system level, but the tests themselves are highly unlikely. Uh, I mean, they're just not going to be as sensitive or as specific as the PCR tests that people have come to rely on. And there's just like some complexity to it. Um, I think that there's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of those tests in the market, though. I, I, I do. And it'll be really a question of the testing strategies that are used to uh, deploy them, where they're deployed, 
uh, and which tests they are that are kind of to determine, you know, is this a nice thing or is it actually genuinely helpful in containing and, and even suppressing the, the virus? And it could potentially make things worse. Like, you know, there's this, uh, if you have a test that's giving people too much false reassurance or, um, mm -hmm. or worrying people falsely, then it can make situations worse. Um, Alexis, you mentioned the emergency use authorization. Usually tests, new tests that are coming to market are vetted by the FDA that are, they are, that will guarantee that they are, um, you know, accurate tests to some degree. No test is perfect, just like no vaccine is perfect, but um, usually we have a longer process to make sure that a test is not giving tons of false negatives or tons of false positives. When you use an emergency use authorization for a medication, for a test, you are bringing something to market because of extenuating circumstances in which you uh, or the FDA deems it to be worthwhile to take this risk on a thing that might not be that accurate, could potentially even make things worse. Uh, how do you feel about the the value of that and how how should <laughs> consumers go about feeling like they yeah. can trust a test or not if it's hasn't gone through the full FDA process? Well, pretty much every test has gone through this particular route, so it's um, it's kind of been a, a, a necessary evil of this time, you know, kind of getting caught um, in the way that we did without a lot of available testing meant that like lots of products like uh, rushed to the market, both PCR and, and now antigen tests. Um, you know, obviously, I think it would be better if we were able to go the full route. Um, I think that, for example, there's a, some questions from you know testing labs sources that I have about how solid the evidence presented um, for the current round of antigen tests has been. Um, so one of the things they'll do is they'll sort of like compare the test to the gold standards and they have sort of like a known sample that they know is positive and they'll have like a known negative sample. And then they'll like, uh, run PCR tests on that and then they'll run um, antigen tests on that and they'll say like, okay, how many of those things did the antigen test like pick up also? Um, but in Abbott's sort of application to go forward, um, you know, they used a tiny number of samples. And I think a lot of the lab folks that I talked with were like, why do they use such a small number of samples? Like this feels uh, quite weird. Um, and so, you know, we talk about the EUA, you know, the emergency use authorization is kind of one thing, but of course, like the FDA can decide what level, what threshold of evidence they're deciding to lean on. And I do kind of wish right now that the threshold of evidence was a, a little bit higher, um, yeah. particularly, you know, before uh, the U.S. government committed $750 million to the test on, you know, uh, less than 200 samples. Like that seems... Um, Either, well, there's like two possibilities. I mean, one is that the the government actually has a lot more samples and has seen a lot more data, but only released this amount to the public. Um, and the other possibility is like that's really all that they've seen, um, and that strikes me as is quite um, quite limited data to make such a, a big decision. So you know, right. like so it's many constant things through tension, this, like just, yeah. the whole. We, we keep having this tension of speed of development versus needing something urgently and how safe um, do we need something to be before we start trusting it? It's exactly. like the story of the pandemic. When would you trust it? One Catherine? question I, well, it's, so this is my question. I mean, I feel like uh, realistically, I'm going to trust it more or less when it, when I can you know, get it. I'm, I'm generally trusting of the process. I know there's a lot of uh, nuance, especially right now, but what are the realistic chances that, you know, is this the kind of thing where in December I'll be able to go into a drugstore, buy a box of, you know, paper strip antigen tests and test myself every day. Is that going to happen? Or we're really far away from that. I think there'll be some, Thing available, maybe not in December, uh, but um, later, later in the winter and into the spring, I think there'll be such tests available. Right. Um, I, I, there's a, but there's this some isn't real basically. I guess. Sorry, my question is: I think is you know, is antigen testing going to change the way the winter looks in this country, or no? We're not on track for that. Well, you know, I mean, if you follow the numbers 
that Abbott has laid out and some other manufacturers are hoping to hit, it could make a difference. I mean, like right now, you know, our seven day average for tests has, has started to spike back up as many states have started to just kind of include antigen tests into their numbers. So we're at like, let's call it 875,000 um, tests uh, a day on average over the last week. The numbers of antigen tests that can be produced are just enormous um, relative to that. <laughs> and so uh, even like basically right now with sort of like production capacity that exists, like you could have, say, the same number of tests, um, antigen tests, as are being done by all the labs um, doing PCR tests. So there's going to there's gonna be something out there. And I think the real questions are the ones that um, Jim is raising, you know, explicitly and implicitly, which is, will the test be good enough to actually help? Will they do more harm than good? Um, which is actually really kind of has a lot of things to do with like behavioral theories about what people are going to do once they have access to this kind of information and this kind of testing. And the other question is whether at home is really kind of like truly the model we want. Like, would it be better to touch in with some medical authority as you do this kind of test um, to give you advice on sort of, okay, well, all right, you've gotten a positive antigen test. What should you do now? Um, and there are some people who've been advocating for widespread mass antigen testing, but still running through um, kind of public health uh, systems. And I could see that maybe this is sort of the system that evolves in, in different places. And in, and in particular within certain cities that have been very proactive about the way that they go to um, to test people. Because I think one of the things that we really forget in all this is that in between sort of like the test manufacturers and someone actually getting a test, there's all this kind of like state and local infrastructure that supports testing, particularly for vulnerable communities or people who don't have a lot of money. And so it's that side of things that I think can may be one of the levers that helps tilt these tests towards being a very useful tool instead of being, you know, useless or, or worse. And, um, that's, that's, you know, but that's, that requires a lot of civic machinery to, to make work. It's a lot of, and you're still talking in your, in your answers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, You're still talking about like using these only in sort of marginally risky scenarios. We 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 know that these tests are not going to be enough to you know it's cold in the flu season. There's going to be a lot of sniffly people, uh, people with coughs and sneezes, and these tests are just not going to have been around enough for us to say, oh, I know you have this hacking cough, but go ahead and go to this party because your antigen test was was oh, negative you know like that, we, we won't want to do that we want to be like oh you, you know you had a high risk exposure but go ahead and have a uh, christmas dinner with your elderly grandparents because you had this negative antigen test like i think we should just plan on um, not doing that <laughs> <laughs> i would not we're not going to have the rigorous yeah. vetting process of these tests in order to be like Oh, uh, the the situation clearly looks risky, but the test is negative, so therefore I'm gonna go ahead and do this thing. I I won't I have mean, the faith in those. Things. Yeah, one hope might be that essentially the antigen test can soak up some of the sort of less uh, vital demand for tests, so that PCR tests can be targeted at people who did exactly have like a high risk exposure, um, or who who have presented with symptoms. Um, and that antigen testing can be used in, in some of these other ways. You know, there, and there's other technologies that are coming along, like for schools in particular, um, pooled testing where you take a bunch of different samples and run them through the same um, uh, machine, like same, like in one sort of uh, test. Um, this technology is kind of like coming along and it just has some features that are quite nice for um, workplaces and schools and, and um, places where you kind of know the group, you can sort of assign risk factors to them, um, and you know you're going to have sort of like a continued um, uh, interaction with those folks. And so, you know, it, this is kind of one of my, again, this goes back to kind of like my main theme of this, uh, <laughs> which is you have all of these things coming online that could help in some way. And when you sort of layer them all on top of each other, you know, some social distancing, pretty good mask adherence in lots of places, 
um, uh, better testing of different kinds and in different layers and with a, a system that's just kind of more robust, some vaccine, tiny bit probably, says Jim, and I think I probably agree with that, you know, but like for some people who would, who, where it would be very important, um, like you layer all those things on top of each other and does that get you somewhere? You know, that, that mm -hmm. really is like kind of like the, the question for me. Um, like, I don't think there's any way you're going to, that all those things are going to knock the virus out, but does it, does it get you to kind of doing what we've been doing so far, which is bumping along with like the rate of transmission about one, which means, you know, each person who gets infected basically infects one other person. You don't get runaway growth of, uh, of transmission, but you also don't really suppress the thing and you continue to have community transmission out there. And that's really the question. We've just been balanced on this kind of knife edge of RT equals one. and are we going to see over the winter that go way up or are we going to see it go way down or are we going to be able to stay balanced on this knife edge even as winter comes because we have this set of tools that help us kind of stay close to that number and and, and that's really right, why right. I, yeah 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 that's winter been winter um, 2021 bumping along on the knife's edge um on the knife's edge <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm just mixing all the metaphors, you know. It's, uh, yeah. You're also well, using a lot of like public health uh, jargon, like RT. I I, uh, I think your head has been uh, really in this space for so long. No, I explained it. Rate of transmission. Like, it, it feels like I'm talking to an expert now. I wouldn't say that really, but I've talked to a lot of experts and their <laughs> words embedded uh, in too much of my brain at this point. Well, can I get us out of expert mode and jargon mode and ask you a really simple question that I think is on everybody's mind, given this, you know, knife's edge that we're on and given all the uncertainty about the fall and winter. Um, Jim, you mentioned Christmas, like ho the holidays, travel, Thanksgiving. Um, when, you know, w will people be able to travel to see their families in the winter? We have a specific question from Michael, who says, should I travel before the fall COVID trend spike, wait until spring, or don't sweat flying because it's relatively safe if one is vigilant? Jim, what is your advice on thinking about travel at, during the winter? Yeah, the flying question is an interesting one we've talked about in past episodes of the show. If you've you really want to get in the weeds, we have that. Um, the, the process of being on the plane itself is pretty safe as long as people are masked. There's a lot of air turnover in planes. So that that isn't something, someplace where I'm anticipating a lot of infections spreading. We have not seen that even before we were masking. We, we didn't see widespread transmission within planes. It happens usually when people are sitting on a tarmac and the air system is not, you know, is off for a long time. Um, and so it's more about getting to and from the airport and then what you're doing in terms of gathering. And that is where it's concerning. You know, we saw spikes after summer holidays in the U.S. because people were gathering. Um, and in the winter holidays, they tend to be, in most parts of the country, much more indoors, multi-generational, involving people traveling from a lot, you know, from different areas, which means you bring people together and then you disperse again after a possibly contagious event. Um, so, yeah, you know, I know it's really important to people to get together for all kinds of different reasons and for winter holidays. But if this, you know, if there are ways to think about reinventing what that means, um, if you're not if you're someplace where you can't do things outside, um, you know, I, I got to recommend trying to either do things virtually or get together before or after the weather gets so, so bad that you can't be distance and, and outside and as masked as much as possible. I know that that's difficult um, to, that's going to be difficult for a lot of people to, to deal with during an already difficult season, but right, it's something right. I mean, that's, that families should prepare for. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing we've talked a lot about is <laughs> you've talked me through accepting reality and uh, realizing that there is this, there's no going back to normal that we're going to live it this way for a long time. And we have to come up with adaptations rather than um, hoping that some magical thing will happen and we'll go back to normal and be able to uh, have the holidays as we usually do. Um, here's a question about aerosolized uh, transmission. Uh, this is from Eric. Uh, there's 
been uh, news from the CDC, some confusing messaging. And uh, Eric says, I'm left wondering how concerned I should be about it. How strong is the medical evidence for aerosolized transmission? Do you have an updated suggested physical distance to remain from others? And this is also something to think about when we're interacting with family or potentially traveling or seeing other people. How are we supposed to think about aerosol, aerosols and transmission? I think, Alexis, when you, um, this would be a great question for Dr. Fauci when you talk to him in a little bit. Um, <laughs> but basically, there was this old binary paradigm of like something is droplets, meaning it's only coming out in the big things that you cough or sneeze out, you know, like the actual goo that's plopping onto a surface, which means it could carry a few feet, but it's not going too far. And then some other things are airborne, meaning they're just kind of lingering indefinitely in the environment. And this virus seems to be breaking, helping us understand that that is a false binary, that there are sometimes, um, it seems like when people are singing, when they're projecting, depending on their the nature of the airflow around them, that this virus can hang in the air for periods of time, uh, long periods. But we don't know, you know, what concentration of the virus needs to be in air in order to make that air dangerous and make a person, um, you know, put a person at high risk. But all the recommendations about going out outdoors, about ventilation, about masking even when you are not near someone who is coughing or sneezing, all those bank on the idea that we are trying to stop airborne transmission. And I think if it, if it was so simple that you basically had to be coughed on or sneezed on um, by a sick person in order to contract this, you know, we would not be seeing 40,000 cases a day. It seems that they're just based on the epidemiolog epidemiologic evidence. There are trans there's transmission happening um, between people who uh, have <laughs> have not come in contact with droplets from from someone else. The question is more like why did CDC change that that guidance? And I'm not sure we need to need to get into that. But it's it's basically goes back to that old binary, right? Like once you classify something as airborne, we have these different protocols and procedures that would need to uh, happen in order to um, prevent it from from spreading. It's the best I can understand for why we don't want to formally classify it as an airborne infectious disease. Well, here's a practical question for you know, members of the public, myself included, for interpreting changing guidelines um, and for interpreting news that seems to shift all the time. How, I mean, how am I as a just member of the public supposed to interpret uh, if I hear, if I see a headline about the CDC changes guidelines? Um, how do I react? How do I make sure I am understanding what's going on? Well, guidelines change. They should, you know. Our, our understanding of the virus changes, our understanding of vaccine timelines changes, of testing accuracy changes. We do our best. That's You're seeing science unfold in real time. What's weird is when you, uh, you know, normally when CDC issues guidelines, especially on something uh, contentious like this, that, you know, thought has gone into it and you don't post it and then remove it whole cloth. That if you did make some error or want to change something, that you have a clear explanation for, for what happened here and that there's transparency transparency about it. Um, so you don't generally see a major statement like that go up and then come down. And I can't explain exactly what happened. Yeah. There. You know, my take on this is that really taking a transnational view of, of what's happening is very important because we know that there are certain political pressures being put on to our core public health agencies. And one of the easiest ways of, you know, that's happening other places too. It's not just here, but if you kind of read across all these different countries and you say like, well, what are the epidemiologists saying in Taiwan and, um, you know, in Switzerland, um, that can help you sort of sort out some of the, the noise around the political situation here. Um, and so I, I think it's just, it, it's important and sort of, possibly sad for Americans to realize that the CDC can't just be the sole source for information about this virus. But right now, that probably uh, understanding what's going on requires going outside of the CDC. You, of course, that what the CDC says is important. They're putting out incredible work in different in journals, in other 
ways. But like we just have to take reality into account here and say the CDC is oftentimes a very good source of information, but also has certain constraints because of the American political situation. Yeah. Well, we just have a few minutes left here. So I wanted to close out. I'm curious. I'm trying to think about how to prepare for the winter myself, both kind of practically and just <laughs> mentally. You know, this is such a, um, we've talked on the show about just sort of dealing with things like grief and anxiety. And this is this is a really intense time for everyone. And the idea of having gone through this and then looking at the winter and fall and kind of having to be like, okay, there's more coming. You know, um, I'm just curious if, what what both of you are doing to kind of prepare and do you have any either concrete or philosophical um advice uh for what we should all be doing to kind of get ready for the next season yeah i mean i actually wrote out both for myself but also for the covid tracking project like some scenarios um just to try and like put like real things you know to it you know how many people did i think would you know in these different scenarios you know what's actually happening how many people are in the hospital how many people are, are dying each day and then what what would that mean you know for our project for what it was to cover the pandemic and i think it's helpful to sort of put that fan of possibilities into your mind for most people who aren't you know running a tracking project for COVID-19, you can still do a, a kind of similar exercise with yourself. I think, you know, what happens if you see a large spike in your county, for example? Um, you know, what happens if uh, someone close to you contracts the virus? I think just doing a little bit of that, like pre-planning, because even though we're on this sort of 40,000 case plateau, um, in most places, there isn't like runaway transmission like there was in Arizona and in certain parts of Texas, California, and Florida, uh, and, and other parts of the South. So right now, in most places, a fairly good time to think about, okay, what happens in these different scenarios? And like, when would I feel comfortable doing X, Y, and Z? While you still can kind of have a, a, a clear head now and, and write it down. I mean, I think that's been one of my key things is to make sure to write down what I was thinking at particular times because it's so easy for your baseline to shift because it's such an unprecedented uh, moment. Right, right. Jim? Yeah, speaking of the baseline shifting, I mean, we had 200,000 deaths today. And just, you know, at the beginning of this year, if you said 200,000 people were going to die of a virus, like, and then the day that you actually hit that number, it's just going to seem like, oh, yeah, I guess that is the track that we've been on. So that happened. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess I, yeah. I did write like a 3,000 word piece on this. So if anyone wants to go really in detail about how to survive the winter, um, there's more on it in there. But I think basically it's it's to accept that things aren't going back to normal in a way that um, we may have thought of in terms of pre-pandemic life. There's not going to be a test or a vaccine that absolutely revolutionizes things. We'll just hope that some things um, roll out that make uh, identifying and, and preventing spread slightly easier. I hope there are better masks. I hope they're widely distributed. I hope people um, have an administration and leaders that they can, can, can trust and, and that people have reliable sources of, of information. Uh, and I, I think, it, you know, without that, with you, you just realizing that there are, no matter how vulnerable your situation is or how worried you are, for yourself, you know, that there are people in your community who are going to be struggling economically, who are going to have health concerns that are even greater um, than yours, and that there we all have at least small things we can do in terms of reaching out to people, making sure that people aren't too isolated, that when it gets cold and icy, that people aren't caught in their homes and they can't they can't go out. Um, and if they are, you know, just checking in, uh, just keeping in contact with people, even when it seems kind of... Uh, you know, harder to do and even less fun to just talk to friends and family via Zoom or checking in by phone. Like that is that is going to be really important. It's something to undertake um, deliberately and 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 purposefully as a health intervention for yourself uh, and for them this winter. Yep, and, that's good advice. 
And you'll keep checking in with me, right? Catherine? Exactly. I, I, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> so if you my plan is to just keep doing this podcast and calling both of you and asking my questions. So um, the, we do do a podcast every week called Social Distance. You're welcome to check it out. Um, we also take questions on the podcast from listeners, uh, social distance at theatlantic.com. You can always write us. Uh, yeah, the, talking to both of you has been what's gotten me through this and uh I just appreciate you both for doing that. Um, and thank you to everybody for listening and joining us today and for your smart questions. Um, there's a lot more Atlantic Festival coming up at, tonight on the Ideas stage. There will be House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Dr. Anthony Fauci. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>